It is the discussion segment on New Dawn right here on Radio TV, the People's Daily. And um, this morning, our focus is on the role of peace builders in a fragile democracy. Now, anywhere that you see human beings, you see people, there will definitely be what you call interest. And of course, anywhere you have people who have interests, particularly when there are different people in terms of tribes and religion and the rest of them, there will be interest. And once there is interest, there is bound to be conflict. Now, in even civilized economies or countries in the world, there are conflicts there. But what makes uh, probably all of these civilized economies or countries to be different is how they are able to handle their conflicts. Now, that is why today we are going to be looking at the place and the role of peace builders uh, in fragile democracy like that of um, uh, Nigeria and, of course, um, other African countries. And we have joining us uh, via Zoom this morning, Dr. Olufemi Shotepo. He is the Coordinator of Peace Initiative Network. Thank you so much for joining us um, this morning on the program. All right, Dominic is not alone on the program. I will be joining Dominic and uh, Dr. Shodikbo to do the program for the next few minutes. We'll be talking about peace building and we'll be talking about the democracy and the forms of peace, peace building that we really need in the country. So you're welcome to the program, Dr. Olufemi Shodikbo. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for, for having me. Now, let's begin by looking at... Um, who is a peace builder? I mean, do I need to actually go to school to have some um, um, formal education for me to be a peace builder? Or if, um, I mean, if I have goodwill towards my environment and towards people around me, that's enough to make me a peace builder. Let's begin from there. Uh, well, to start with, uh, peace, peace is divine. Peace is divine in the sense that you know, it's of God, and uh, blessed are the peacemakers. So, uh, well, at times, uh, peacemakers are born and peacemakers are made. Uh, well, for, for one to function well, too, I think one needs to have a level of education. It may not be formal, it may not be a uh, university degree, it must not be maybe a uh, degree, PhD, but at least little basic knowledge of peace building, because peace building is a, uh, it's a deliberate effort. It's something that we all, all have to, uh, to strive to, to make sure uh, we have in our society. So uh, some, are, some were born, you know, we are just naturally peacemakers. Uh, like we went to the, uh, royal, the royalty, we are born into the royalty, chiefs, kings, they are naturally born you know, as a peacemaker. And why so? You know, deliberately, they went to school, go to have basic knowledge about peace, issue of peace. And so, in a nutshell, passion alone is not uh, having the passion is not enough. But we need to have basic knowledge. And when talk about even talk about even the uh, those who are born into royal uh, priesthood or royalhood, priesthood in the sense that maybe those are also maybe pastors or imam. That's another level. They are also. Uh, they venture into peace building. So, but as I said, passion alone is not enough. Zeal alone is not enough. We want to have at least basic knowledge of peace building. Okay, since we are talking about peace building and the nation, how, how can we say a nation is having this low peace? And how can we boost the peaceful existence of people in that locality or in that region? If you see a region that is not doing well peacefully, how do we know what are the measures that will dictate that this uh, region is not too peaceful? And what are the things that should be done to make them peaceful? There are so many indicators, many indicators. Uh, unrest, crisis, strife, uh, on, on, on uh, uh, rivalry that has very you no know, violent rivalry. I think those are the uh, the first major uh, indicators uh, to show that yes, even in, at the family level, when you have strife, no love, uh, lack of uh, cooperation, because these are the values of uh, peace. 
values of uh, issue of like cooperation, team building, working together. These are all virtue of peace. And when we have that, maybe in a very low measure in the, in the community or in the society or in a country, uh, we can now say, well, that country is fragile, fragile in the sense that uh, it has no, no level of peace. And uh, it's something that everybody also, also have to be, the all hands will be on deck. It's not only for the leaders, even for the led, even for the, uh, the, uh, the colonists, as we, as, we call, as we have to call it. Every one of us has to uh, align ourselves to a peaceful conduct within our family, in our society, in our office, on the road. You can see even the way we drive on the, on the, on the road. You find people are not, uh, you know, not following the rules, the traffic rule. It's, it's also uh, a measure that we can see as indicators of not being peaceful. So not to talk about, talk about uh, people that are maybe um, arms, uh, arm group like Boko Haram we have in Nigeria, and the banditry, uh, banditry and then the, the kidnappers. I, I think that is where we now go to a higher level. But on a lower scale, the issue of peace is something that when a home is peaceful, when you, when you come in, you, you see it. There will be no strife. You see love. You can, you can feel it. You can, you can feel it. Okay, can we, can we live in a region uh, without conflict? Is it possible? Uh, well, even the world as, as a whole, conflict is inevitable. There's no way we can, we can, live, we can, we can live without conflict. But when it becomes violent, that is when it becomes you know, abnormal. Because conflict, when we talk of conflict, we are, there are various types of conflict. We have personal conflict, we have interpersonal conflict, we have intra-group conflict, we have intrastate conflict, we have interstate conflict. So these are levels of conflict and types. But to say we we'll live without conflict or stress, no, there's no way we can. Because it is when we also have such, that's when we're able to, in general, to a man, we come out. But when it becomes violent, that's when it becomes abnormal and not too good. So conflict is inevitable. For a meaningful development in every society, there must be level of conflict. Now, probably you should tell us um, some of the primary challenges that peace builders like you and others actually encounter uh, in fragile democracies or communities uh, where they have so much of role to play, really, in restoring peace. The, the first thing is that as a peace builder or as a mediator, let me now take it now as a mediator, because uh, as a peace builder, when you are now... Uh, it, it, you, you want to be involved in, in third party conflict. You now you, you you come in as a mediator, and as a mediator you have to be neutral. You don't have interest, and the level of trust between the conflict uh, factions must be there. If they don't trust you, uh, you can't you can't you can't you can't intervene in such in such a crisis or conflict. So you must have uh, uh, you must be the, the level of trust. People must trust you for them to uh, to allow you to, to come in, to, to mediate, uh, like we have in most of the internet, even national or international conflict. You find we have some eminent groups, eminent personalities that are know that are seen as above board, that they know that they don't have any they don't have any interest of the warrior factions. So the first element of want to be a peace builder or a mediator is you must you must have a level of trust. And your own personality too, you must also have a level of uh, a personality that is, uh, that is seen as transparent. Transparent in the sense that you are seen as somebody that is not, uh, you don't have any, no shady deals. You are eminent. You are eminent, as we call them, in, either at the AU or at the UN level. So you, you must be eminent for you to be seen as a peacemaker or as a mediator in a conflict. All right, let's, let's look at the forms of peace building that should be adopted for any country at that that is experiencing unrest or war, conflict, insecurity, and all that. What, type, what best options do you think can be adopted if this uh, 
problem is to be overcome or if this problem is to be stopped the, entirely. The, 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 best option, the best option, the best option, and the only only credible option that has stand the test of time over the year is mediation. Mediation and then dialogue. Dialogue in the sense that no matter how long we war, 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 there will be need for us to judge, judge, judge. And for us to judge, judge, there's more, there must be uh, element of uh, uh, coming together to dialogue. Uh, dialogue means everybody know we, we, we have to lay aside all our interests, our positions, and then we, we also have to uh, align with uh, the, the, the principles of dialogue. So dialogue is, 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 is very, very important in every peaceful society. And for us to achieve peaceful society, peaceful world, the element of dialogue must be there. And that is what we preach as peace builder. There's need for us to, to dialogue. There's no need to, uh, to, to talk about, you know, continue to go on the, on, the, on the ramp page. And another level is also that we just have to issue of forgiveness. Forgiveness, because if there's no forgiveness, there's no peace. We just have to forgive. Okay, are you saying, sorry, as addendum to that, are you saying if someone is dialoguing or is a mediator, for instance, their interests won't come in? How do they treat their emotions, especially when they belong to a particular region that is facing that crisis? How do you take away emotions when you're mediating or when you're dialoguing or when you're bringing peace to the table? Is it possible to take out their emotions and work towards the peace building? Yeah, we can only we can only suppress the emotions. It's not that we can't take it out. It's, it's not uh, we can only suppress it. Suppress in the sense that uh, we don't have we, it must not have a preeminence in in, in, our, in the discussions. So uh, and for and it was also give and take. Uh, you, you you lose you take one and you lose some you win some. So and for us to have such a, a level playing field is what we also talk, talk about issue of a, a win win situation. You lose some and you win some. So, and for every mediator, every mediator also know that, yes, you cannot allow a, a, a section or a part to lose more than is, is required, because that is where even your credibility as a mediator will also be, will be questioned. So you have to, uh, in terms of, uh, maybe I should just uh, look at the, the Nigerian Civil War in, in this seven to seventy where we go to where we went to the Aburi you know Aburi Accord and all sorts of meetings in Morumbia and all the other countries of the world. You, you, you could see that everybody has to lay down their interests. The interests have to be the preeminent interest will be the national interest or the global interest if it's a global uh, conflict. So the the issue of emotions have to be curtailed. Because if emotion is not curtailed, it, it may also aggravate uh, a level of violence. Now let us look at let us... And, and, and for you as a mediator, too, you have to learn how to manage such emotions. Because if it are not managed, if it are not well managed, it will, it will even do more harm than good. Do more harm than good. And that's why, as peace builder, as peacemaker, you have to also have the knowledge of uh, do no harm. A do no harm means that when you come into any conflict setting, into into a uh, immediate immediate role, you have to know that you are not coming to compound the problem, but to solve, uh, uh, to be a solution to the to the problem. How much of recognition really is given to uh, peace builders uh, in Nigeria? I ask this because I know that um, we have also had our own fair share of uh, conflicts um, as a nation, as communities. Uh, there are boundary disputes here and there. Uh, and these are things that, I mean, bu peace builders would actually have come in to resolve. But a lot of the times, these um, disputes and conflicts uh, actually get out of hand. Uh, to contextualize this, um, the Okwoma and Okoloba communities mm -hmm. in Delta State recently I mean, would have been perfectly handled and resolved by peace builders uh, before it generated to the massacre of um, those uh, military personnel, which now worsened the situation. Uh, as a matter of fact, they are in court now, I mean, because um, the military moved in and we know the rest of the details. 
um, how much of recognition really uh, is given to peace builders in the country and how do we bring them in to wade into circumstances like this in this case i, I think i have to also maybe try to also uh maybe uh, uh come up with uh, some certain uh, concept too like when you talk about peace builder there are peace builders and there are peacemakers uh peacemakers and there are also uh those that maybe like the military uh, that, that will call them in terms of uh, uh what i mean is that there are leader approach to conflict to uh, resolve conflict and also those who are also soft approach the soft approach the military approach is never is a soft approach and when you come in as a military in a conflict people already you know they they, they guide their their, 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 their interests they just say that okay yeah, you're coming because it's, it is perceived that a military person is not always, always you know, coming with force. But as a peace builder, you must have to come with, you know, it's a soft approach. A soft approach that you, you, the committee must also believe in you that, yes, you don't have any interest. They must also have that uh, the genuineness in you that, yes, you are, you are neutral and you don't have any uh, any interest in, in, in the conflict at stake. So the issue in the, in, in, the, in the Delta and even beyond, you could find that the, the local peace builder like, like, like ours, what we do mainly is that we, 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 we tend to uh, engage with the locals, talking to the community leaders, religious groups, youth groups of various types. And if this political uh, uh, crisis, we, we talk to the, to the to various political parties, they are youth groups. And we are in most cases, I think peace builders are we are also very vulnerable. Vulnerable in the sense that you may also come with your you know, genuineness, the, the interest of of, of, of uh, mediation in any in, in country. But as a Nigerian, we know we 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 are seeing force from our either from our ethnic standpoint or our religious standpoint. A case in point in a Yoruba man or Igbo man but trying to uh, to to wade into conflict in the northern Nigeria, we we'll, we we'll have that uh, how will I call it identity crisis because the, the northerner will look at you as okay oh this is Yoruba man he's a Christian they will just that will also be like a barrier to 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 to, to move on but when you are part of the society you are one of them. But they also know that you don't are you are not, you are, not a, you are a political you don't belong to political uh, party A or party B and you are not uh, so much entrenched in maybe in religious in religiosity in religious A or religious B uh, that will also make you to become uh, to make it more uh, so, so at, at the global level we have we have uh, we have peace builders and we also have uh, a speak keep uh, peacekeeping I want to say peacekeeping. Peacekeeping is more of a military task, and it goes with all the uh, uh, with the, uh, the the boots on, on the ground. And, and when you go in with the boots on the ground, and you want to uh, with all the ammunition, and you are talking about peace, people will be aggressive. People will just do it. okay. Well, this guy can they can turn it and then start to you know, be on on offensive. But when you go as a peace builder. Eminent personalities that they know, these are elderly people that they are not even wrong. If, for instance, Baba Obasanjo uh, has been going all along everywhere, meditating in Congo, just everywhere. But you could see that when the life of uh, Baba Obasanjo goes into a crisis, going to, uh, to mediate, people listen. Not when you go with the with, 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 with gun and you talk about peacekeeping. It, it, it will work. Okay, that would take us to the challenges that peace uh, builders face in peace building. Do you have any particular challenge that you think should uh, is is not making the work of peace building be known to the society that much? Because we know that a lot of peace builders will come out and tell you there is a crisis somewhere. If the government is not doing this, then this can happen. And uh, we, we know a, a lot of times a government will not want to listen to those people because they don't see them as being in their group or, or, or something like that. So what are the challenges that you think peace builders are facing globally first and uh, I, 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 nationally as a Nigerian? 
Yeah, well, let me start from our, our, our local context. Yeah, why peacemakers are not? It, it's because it's alien. It's alien to us in the sense that alien that people tend to that or that when you want to uh, come in as a peace uh, builder or as a peacemaker, people look at you. And that, where are you from? As I just said, a Yoruba man uh, trying to uh, to mediate in the outside or in evil uh, context is something that that is uh, no questionable. But aside aside that. One of the main reasons why peace builders are not also uh, not giving that recognition is that uh, we, we tend to uh, to underplay the role of peacemakers. Uh, you know, the government officials, the com community leaders, religious groups, and they are also pe uh, peacemakers and peace builders. But the, the the tendency is that, but when things go when maybe go beyond uh, beyond control. I'll give you an instance. Uh, since, an instance uh, in, in 2014, I remember very well when the issue of Boko Haram was you know, at the front burner, very, very hot. The, the, the Office of the National Security Advisor called on we peacemakers all over, all over the country, about 60 of us across, across the nation, to help them to see how we could use our own soft approach because they've used all the military means, all the you know attacking and all the whatever, but it's not yielding any results. But when we were, when we were called, we were called and we formed a group called Partnership Against Violent Extremism, domicile at the office of the National Security Advisor in in Abuja. Results started coming, and that is why now most of the um, the, the actions that you see coming up from the uh, from the office of the national security advisor to the president is now having element of you no know, soft approach. Issue of uh, uh, how do we uh, rehabilitate the the, the, the repentant Boko Haram members? And these are all ideas from 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 civil society, from peacemakers, from peace builders in, in the country. Because it is not enough to to use force. Force alone will, will not bring peace. We have to use that human element which is peace building. Mm. Mm. That will take me to this one that, that about the, the awareness of peace building in the society. Do you think Nigerians have enough education about peace building? And if they do not, how, what is your own effort as, as a peace builder to ensure that you go to people, educate them, and let them know the importance of peace building in the nation? And that's one reason why we also have you know, videos and you know, programs. We, we have advocacy events whereby, you know, to the policymakers, to religious groups, to youth leaders, and to see the need for us to be to be vanguard for peace in our communities. Because, as I said, government alone cannot do it. The military not. The military, the military might alone cannot do it. We need to have the human element. And the human element is for us to come together to help and support the government and support even our leaders to, to, to maintain peace in our communities. And what we do as, as a peacemakers, we, we have associations, we have our networks across the country. And what we do more is that we, if all of us are involved in this in this trade, it is not enough. So all of us must be, we, there are just for, there's need for us to, to recruit more peace builders across the country because that is where we, what can make our country uh, peaceful when all of us are engaged in peace okay, young so or old women or, 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 and, and, and youth in recruiting are you are you are you looking towards the youth um, sector the, because we know that when there is a crisis we see a lot of youths there and they, they will be at the forefront leading the cause or or showing their strength the ability the energy to to push forward crises and conflicts. What is your role in ensuring that these youth come on board and become peace builders? Indeed, the youth, the youth are even they are the, they are the, even at the forefront of our, of our recruitment uh, process. Uh, we, we, we do that uh, in schools and for out of schools. Uh, uh, youth. Uh, we also even go beyond the youth, but even children, children in, in primary school, uh, because it's, it's good to start catch them very young. When you catch them young, that's where they will, you know, they will live with it. I, I, I could see if uh, we could have even in our curriculum beyond the social studies, beyond the civic education, there's need for us to also input elements, uh, basic knowledge of peace building in our curriculum. Uh, that is from the uh, primary school, from the elementary, elementary level, up to the tertiary uh, level. And what we do mainly is also we engage the young people 
And we don't even just uh, engage them as maybe project participants. We we want them to to, to take a lead, to lead in our in, in, in our in our program, uh, both in ten hours. formulation, both program formulation, implementation, and also monitoring and evaluation of our programs. So we want them to take ownership. We want the youth to take ownership of the project because they, they have longer years. Those of us who are above 50, we, we, we have less, less time to, uh, to, to be around. But for those who are in their early, early days, they have, some have 40, 50, 60 years uh, to be around. And these are the people that will serve as the vanguard for peace in our communities. And that's why we, we, our programs, we, we, we tend to uh, look at what are the needs and what are the interests of young people. Look, talking about issues of sports, music, drama. So we, we take all these uh, to, to them. Even at the, even social media, we know they are, they are there on social media. So we, we take this uh, crusade of peace building to, to the youth in the field of sports, in the, in the, in the in, through music, through drama, to everything that we know that young people you know they have interest on. And that's what we've been doing. And we know that it's, it's really yielding because you also have much more young people now coming out to, to form associations and to talk about the issue of peace and good governance in our country. Now, how, how important really is the place of uh, the communities that are actually at conflict with each other uh, in determining the strategies that would actually achieve the peace that you want to achieve for them. How important is their involvement in determining the strategies that will go about achieving the peace required? And that's why I said, you know, what we do, what we call, we call it community ownership. Mm -hmm. Community ownership in the sense that uh, the, the, the warring factions, the communities are part of, even from the formulation of the, of the programs, they are part of, they have input. It's not something, we don't just bring templates either from Abuja or from Lagos uh, to maybe to work in the state. Uh, like the issue of courtesy uh, uh, in Inogo. You don't bring a Boko Haram template from Bruno and want to work in Inogo. So you have to involve, you have to involve the young people, the people in the community. You have to involve the traditional rulers, the community leaders, the religious groups, and every, even the women. The women also have to be involved. And we must have their input in the process and also during even implementation of the programs or projects they should take the lead it's not just to uh, to serve as project participants but they are to be the originator of, of this of this project and at the end of the program they because programs of either ngo or cso's will only last for two three five five ah, yes, five years after five years for apple for sustainability of the program or project community ownership is very key and that's what we preach in all our programs. The community has to take the lead in, the, in, 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 in providing solutions to their problems. Because people cannot come out from outside and know what's happening. It is the people in the community that know what is happening in their community, and they can provide tangible solutions to their problems. Now, let, let us look at um, monitoring uh, peace, uh, peace um, moves or, or, or successes. Uh, what metrics, really, or indicators um, do you think um, are most effective in assessing uh, the peace moves uh, or, or, or strategies, really, that have been uh, backed upon? The major metric, the major methods that will work and that will stand the test of time is involving the local people. Let the local people assess the program, both the impact and the sustainability. Because if the, young, if the local people are not involved in it, it's just like it's just like a mere project, a mere project that should not even uh, at, at the end of the program. It's it just that's all. But when the people are involved, involved in the sense that there should be like meetings, probably even bringing back after all the uh, all said and done after the project, convening a, 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 a meeting of critical stakeholders, relevant stakeholders, for them to also see and to look back. Incrementally and incrementally to see how the programs have been over that way, that way, uh, I would like to it. So, to also uh, analyze and then give their own uh, 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 their input, we, we do this through uh, group discussions. We can call it group discussions, focal group discussions. We do this even through interview. We could come, you know, and that would be even involving 
external external mon uh, monitors, people that can form that don't, are not part of, of the project to 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 interview people and to hear from them firsthand what are the, the, the impact and what are the results of, of, of the programs and the projects. And another one also is that the need to also involve even the even the government officials, the political uh, leaders, the policy makers, the religious leaders in all these aspects. That is where we can have a meaningful program that can that, that can test uh, that can stand the test of uh, sustainability and have meaningful impact in our program. And not just to just maybe sit down in the office and write reports. No, it's for you to also make sure that the people that are involved in the programs, both the participants, are also they also have they review review what we, we've done over the years and give you a very meaningful uh, uh, feedback. Okay, uh, we know that um, uh, peace builders in Nigeria have they have um, a framework that guides their movement, guides their activities all along their their, their duties. And uh, how, how implementable how implementable are these frameworks? And how do you think the government or people you prefer these frameworks to? How do they implement? Do, do, do they implement to? your satisfaction and if not what do you think they should do to implement the framework of peace building uh, the first thing we do is also in every program we do there will, there will be element of uh, capacity building capacity building is says that you, you know you, you train them on how to even how to also even know that yeah, the program is not uh, to how to monitor the program and how to also look at what are the indicators to look for for meaningful impact and above all the 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 any peace maker or speed builder that's coming with a template from anywhere to work in any community will surely fail. So there's need for you for you as a peacemaker to involve to just just on whatever template you are bringing from anywhere, but use the template of the locals, the people in the local communities. They are the ones that can give you the template that will work in every community. As I'm saying now, the uh, the what we work in the state might not work in Ondo or in Kano. So it's, it's, it has to be, uh, we have to contextualize the, even the, uh, the, the, your, your approach and your project. It's not something that, okay, well, we've done this in, in maybe in Niger Delta, and you're coming to uh, Plateau or going to, uh, to come into a state. What work in the South South, the South South, may not work in the Southwest. So the template has to be contextualized. It has to be within the community. And within the community means that the local people have to have input in it. And they are the ones that will also run it. Over the years, over the years, even the development partners, the usage of this world, World Bank, UN, they've been having all those templates, but it's not working. It is now, we are now using what we call decolonization of programs. Decolonization of programs means that we have to allow the local people to take lead in their affairs. So it's not enough to bring programs from New York or from Belgium, from EU, or from EU, uh, London to Nigeria. But you have to involve Nigerians in, 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 in program. Elaro, you were talking about the involvement and the role of um, youth in peace building efforts and the rest of them. And then what came to my mind was um, uh, in the society, I mean, in Africa, there is this belief that it's a men's world, it's a men's um, society. And so um, when it comes to peace efforts and the rest of them, men definitely have significant roles to play, you know. But again, uh, the women folk, I, I know that they can as well be very, very useful in uh, efforts like this. Can you please tell us some of um, their roles? Uh, uh, as um, peace builders, and of course, even as um, I mean, part of the communities who uh, uh, we should be designing uh, uh, particular peace efforts for. The, the, the role, the role of women cannot be over, over, over emphasized in peace making, in peace building, because uh, we also know that yes, they have a very key role. Uh, they, they are they are there as mother, at home, as wife, as sisters, and they also have uh, influence. On all, even even leaders, as a wife, they, they have they have influence. So it's both nationally and internationally, like the Beijing the, the Beijing uh, conferences, uh, also specify the need to engage more women. And this also uh, take us to what we call gender mainstreaming of peace building. 
if not only peace building, even of development programs, there's need for us to have to mainstream gender. Mainstream gender in the sense that we have to look at it from that gender lens. Gender doesn't mean that we men or women, but let's also have everybody on board. And I know even at, at our own local level, we have a role of women, women, and the, the women, even peace building organizations, are also springing up on a daily basis. And because they are now giving preeminence, because they know that, yes, it's like, it's like the men have failed. So let's see if the women can do better. And we can see that the young women, both young people and women, coming on board now to be part of peacemaking. It's really, it's really working. I know in our society, it's more like a, it's a men's world, uh, globally. But uh, now, I think there's a shift, a shift in gender mainstreaming of projects and of programs involving more of women in, peace, in peacemaking. All right, now let's talk about the influence of uh, global players on uh, peace building. We see that countries fight countries, and uh, and when you look at these things on, on, on the social media space or, or on your national television, you want to look at why your country is doing some things, and you want to compare and say that you are towing the same path with other countries too. So uh, do, do we have influence of global players on local communities, for instance, in Nigeria, do, can you say that the influence of what is happening in the USA or the UK, or, or, or the influence will be on Nigeria, Nigerians? Uh, well, the, the, we, 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 there's no country that will live, I know, that live in isolation. Uh, we are member, majority of about 103 countries are members of the UN. And the UN, so with the, the treaties, with the, uh, the conventions, which major countries are also signatory to. And when, when you are signatory to a convention or to a, to a, uh, to a, to a treaty, it, it is, it is, it's, it's on you that you have to also uh, bring it back to your, you know, to your community, to, your, to, to also localize it. And then to make it that yes, become your your guiding principles. Um, a case in point is the, uh, the 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 issue we have across the world, uh, and the issue of both multilateralism and then bilateral relations also affect uh, affect in the sense that Nigeria is a colonial, you know, uh, of uh, is a colony of of, of 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 Britain, and that influence is still there, no matter how, no matter what. Like when you talk of even like. Like what's happening now in 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 Niger, in Mali, that you find the 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 colonial interest is like it's waiting, it's just thinning out. People are saying no, we don't want to have, uh, we want to be on our own. But on the global scale, the 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 northern nations and then the 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 members of the Security Council, the, G, the so called G five, that have a uh, veto uh, and the reserve powers, uh, they have that power and influence over above everybody because when when the countries, when they also come, you know, to General Assembly and resolve a vote for a, a vote or two from the G5, from the big five, can just neutralize all the discussions of all the other one and something uh, countries. So what am I saying is that the the uh, we are also we have our interest interest in the sense that we have our partners, we have people that we believe that can support us, uh, like. Nigeria, you know, it's an uh, Anglophone country. Uh, we we, we tend to taste towards, uh, towards the British uh, and then maybe to, to the Americans to, uh, to, uh, to some extent. But that told me that we cannot also, also go to the East. East in the sense that maybe to China. We can see Chinese are coming now, even to Africa. To, it's, it's a game of influence. And the influence that you, that you, you Ghana also is also done by your, by your economic power and your political power. So how many political, how much more political power do we have to, 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 to gauge maybe the influence of, say, America or, say, Britain? And that's why uh, we just have to tell towards you know, people that we know or countries that we know will support us. And like what is happening now in the Middle East, in the Middle East, between Israel and Hamas and Palestine, this has been on. It's an age-long uh, crisis. It's what we call intractable conflict. Intractable conflict says that it's like it's, like, it's endless, endless because the interest is also endless. You have the you know the major five. You you have the, the from the, from the west, from the east, Russia and North Korea, China, all playing their own role. So 
That is why the issues of conflict globally will remain because of all these interests. And this is the game that nation plays. It's a game of interest, so-called national interest. Okay, let's look at um, the place and the role of the media, really, in all of this, in promoting conflict, and of course, how the media can also be used as a tool in resolving conflict. Let, let's, let's take a look at um, these two sides of um, the coin. The, the role of media is so, so, so vital. Vital in the sense that, because you, what, you, you, you determine the, uh, how do I call it, you, the opinion, you mold opinion. The media mode opinion and the shape opinion. A, a case in point is 1994, the genocide in Rwanda. It was from the radio station that the the uh, the, uh, the hatred, the the hate speech, you know, were spreading out, were coming out. And I think every day you find less than I mean, within a space of time, millions of people were killed. So this need for uh, the media people also to be to be sensitive. There's a program called. Conflict sensitivism, conflict sensitive for the journalist because if uh, it's not just to uh, how do I call it sensational, we, the issue of crisis is not something that that should be sensationalized. It's something that has to come with you know with facts and with emotions because people life is involved. But for a a, a good uh, journalist a, a media house should know that yes they have to be conflict sensitive in their reporting. If a media house has not conflict sensitive, we, we do more harm than good. And that's why it is also, you know, uh, I know in almost every country, like in Nigeria, we have NBC. There are some border you cannot cross, even in, in, your, in your programming. You have to, you know, it's not something you just come on air and just, and that is why uh, the issue of uh, social media also, also is something we have, we have to look at. Because the social media is not, you know, these are on train, anybody can just, Sit down, sit down, you know, just be in the comfort of your home and start. It could be fake, it could be rumor, it could be, uh, it could be um, untrue stories. And that's why we also have to be very careful that, yes, the media, they also have a, a very big role to play in peace building. All right, now let's talk about the political will of uh, the, the political class. How much of this political will? can help in peace building if you're looking at a setting of a fragile democracy. I don't want to mention a country that has a fragile co a democracy. If there is a fragile co uh, demo uh, democracy, what, how much of this political will should be put in place so that peace can be maintained and everybody will live peacefully? The political leaders also have a major role to play because, you no, know, uh, aside from uh, you know, uh, campaigning and politicking, immediately after the elections and the results are announced, there's need for everyone to come to, to, to align. For every patriotic, you know, uh, person or uh, citizen, they need to know the, to know when the political start and ends. It, it ends, you know, immediately after the result is announced, and maybe we're well, going to court and all, all the other processes, but immediately the is a job that okay, this is the winner. It is it is it is it is an increment on every uh, uh, good citizen to to know that yes, you don't play politics with life, you don't play politics of violence, you don't play politics of uh, you know, of uh, hatred. If you really want to serve the country or serve your people, there's need to know that yes, when the when the uh, and that's also we also have to also start. A, a very strong warning and note to even to the uh, to the umpires, to the electoral bodies that there's need to be you know to play the role according to you know to uh, yes to to, to 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 be fair to all so that there will not be any need for any misdemeanor after the elections and for the political leaders for every political leaders that also want to serve his people you cannot serve them when they are when, when it's only serve when they are alive you can't serve them when they are dead and it is not only for you to uh, to 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 uh, our local it to instigate violence, and and we know that most you know the bad politicians because we also have bad and good politicians. But some are they don't just want to lose; they want to win back at all at all at all costs. And for such, I think there's also for us to even as people to know who are our leaders, and who we know that can you know that will be there for us even in terms of crisis. Now let's look at um, uh, the roles of um, 
peace builders and peacemakers um, even before uh, conflict, when there are no conflict. Uh, I, I know that it's not just uh, perfect for uh, peace builders to come and um, to come in or move in when we have conflict alone. Uh, as a matter yep. of fact, we can save ourselves a lot by preventing conflicts mm -hmm. uh, and um, yes, and all sorts from happening in, in, in the first place. Now, what are those roles that peace builders or that you are actually making to ensure that um, every community uh, enjoys uh, peace, really, and that um, uh, conflicts are actually avoided? Uh, prevention is one of the one of the, one of the major uh, uh, process that we, we know we undertake. We, we we don't just have to wait till when you know it snowball into a major crisis or, or violent conflict, uh, and that's why also uh, there's also need for us to also have uh, programs even in the in the in the so-called peaceful society. Uh, I mean, in the uh, community where there are no violence, we, we need to learn from them. How are they, how are they doing it? And then from there, we can also use that as you know, a springboard to where there are violence. But we know normally a peace builder will, doesn't, doesn't go to, uh, to, to, to war or to, uh, to, uh, to engage during violence. But, and that is more reason why our programs are more of prevention. It's a preventable uh, thing that we do. We, we go to the communities, in the schools, we are programming schools, we are programmed with women, with youth, uh, to, to, uh, to curtail uh, violence and to curtail and to also build relationships. What we do mainly is you know, to build relationships. Uh, like Nigeria is you know, a very heterogeneous society where we have various uh, ethnic groups and religious uh, lining. So what we do mainly is to see that how can we live together peacefully? And this go beyond tolerance. No, we don't use the language tolerance. We use understanding. Because when you only tolerate to a certain level, at the point your tolerance level will be no, it, it, it will, it's elastic. So we, 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 we tend to talk about more of understanding. Let us understand ourselves. A Yoruba person, Igbo, Hausa, Fulani, we, are not, we, we, we cannot reason together the same way. Because our culture defies our way, way of looking at things differs. So how do we now search for that common ground? The common ground that will make us you know, live peacefully. And that's what every peace builder should do. To, to, to see how we can you know, search for that common ground, how we can also uh, build trust even among ourselves, even in, in, in terms of, in case of even violence or even uh, a potential uh, crisis, there's need for us to, uh, to listen and then to also forgive ourselves, even when there are crises. Okay, as, as we close the program now, I, we want you to give a word of advice to everybody watching us on peace building. Why should we take peace building very important and what are the benefits that are accrued from having a peaceful society? For every community to, for every community to develop, even to live, to live well, there must be an element of peace. And that is why every ant must be on deck. All of us, the young people, women, community leaders, religious groups, everyone, we have, to, we have a role to play in peace building. And that is one of the reasons why we just have to make sure that, yes, even in the family, because that way, you know, that's, that's where we have that's the first element. So we have to, uh, all hands must be on deck. We have to do something that we you know, because without peace, there will be no development, either economic or when a, 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 a society that is not, that's not peaceful, that does that, that lack that uh, element of peace, we can't go to even our business. We can't do anything. So for us to guide, guide against uh, having something that will, that will be detrimental to our, to our, to our well-being, there's need for us to be, to be all hands to be on deck. We all have to be a peacemaker. We must thank you so much for your time with us um, this morning, uh, Dr. Olufemi uh, Shodipo, uh, looking at um, this all-important topic, uh, role of peace builders in a fragile democracy. And um, he has um, said that one of the things he has said is that um, you and I also have a role to play yeah, in ensuring mm. a peaceful society. We are also peacemakers and peace builders. Mm. Uh, so uh, we should actually deploy uh, our abilities 
our God-given abilities and intellects and abilities, yes, to ensure there is peace in society. We've been speaking with um, Dr. Olufemi Shodepo, uh, the coordinator, Peace Initiative Network via Zoom. Thank you so much for your time with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Charity, we've got to go. All right, that's the size of the program for today. And next week promises to bring different editions of the new John to you from Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We'll be having the English version on Tuesday and Thursday. The real version will come on air. God willing, we'll see you next week. Thank you so Why much, sir. Why does that? Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.